right, our guest, first guest for this Wednesday is Anne Kilbriggs, an Niger Delta activist and an advocate for true federalism. And she joins us via Zoom from Port Harcourt, I presume. Uh, Madam Anne Kilbriggs, thank you so much for joining us. Good morning and thank you for having me. It's good to see you as always. <laughs> thank you and you too. All right, let's start by asking your reaction to some of the issues raised by the president in his Democracy Day broadcast on Saturday, especially as it concerns the Southeast and the South South. Well, I mean, um, from just before Democracy Day, um, the president made uh, two, um, two statements, which is really quite amazing. Um, when you realize that this is uh, our president that uh, does not speak to Nigerians. And so to make um, those statements back to back three days in a row, for me, um, it meant that the president wanted to say something to the South South and to, and to the South East. And um, almost everything uh, he said, I, um, I view them and understood them uh, to be threats and um, not really uh, talking to the people of the um, of the South South or the people of the South East that are really uh, the people that um, are from the defunct um, uh, old Eastern region that was engaged, um, that the Nigerian government engaged in a war um, almost uh, six, uh, how many decades um, ago? You know, so um, everything for me was, um, was a threat. There was nothing there to indicate that the president understood or wanted to understand um, what the people of the South, uh, South, South and Southeast, um, I mean, yes, and Southeast have been saying, and even the whole uh, Southern region, which uh, included uh, the Yoruba people as well, and by a large extension, um, the Middle Belt, since we seem to be speaking uh, the same language, if you, um, <laughs> if you like. All right, just, just then on the, you know, what the perceptions are, um, I, I remember that, first of all, we do remember the president uh, saying that he belongs to everyone and doesn't belong to no one in particular, you know, from the campaign days and um, he's, he's almost six years or rather six years in office. And this is happening now where, you know, references are made to specific parts of, you know, Nigeria as being you know, dots in the circle. How, how do you review that from a man who said he belongs to everyone to a man who has, you know, come out clearly by body language and speech to say that there is a bias in some of the treatment lines of different ethnic groups? Um, uh, first of all, I, um, I must say that um, from here on, and for a very long time, actually, I have always spoken from the platform of... Um, being aware of what, uh, how we got independence, when we got independence, and when our um, uh, our national anthem went something like um, uh, brotherhood, you know, do tongue and tribe may differ, and in brotherhood we stand. That is the um, the Nigeria that I am speaking from and to. Um, now, looking at uh, what the president said, I belong to. Um, I belong to no one, I belong to uh, everybody, which really um, was also uh, something that he picked up from another president. But, I mean, he debunked that uh, immediately he was, uh, after he was sworn in, which was his uh, a ceremonial, one of his uh, phrases of his ceremonial speeches. And he traveled abroad uh, in America, and when he was asked um, what he intended to do, about uh, the, the agitation of the United Delta people. Um, if we recall, the president uh, immediately made it very clear that there were people he regarded as 97% of uh, Nigerians. And then there were people he regarded as 5%. Now, 97 um, plus 5 is actually uh, 100, 102. And so maybe the other extra were people that uh, were going to come into Nigeria. That's one, two. Um, following that, uh, the president went to uh, the United Nations and uh, started demanding for uh, self-determination for the Palestinian uh, people, um, uh, referencing what was happening to the Palestinian uh, people on behalf, on behalf of Nigeria. Now, um, for, in my opinion, that take is, is very striking because here you are 
uh, a president of a country that is Muslim and Christian going on a world forum in the name of both Muslims and Christians and now favoring uh, the plight of Muslims um, in another part of the world for self-determination and yet criminalizing his own people, supposedly his own people, in quotes, um, uh, Nigerians, who are also demanding for, uh, for self-determination. So in Nigeria, we have two Nigerians, uh, Nigerias, and we really, really have to accept this reality if we actually want Nigeria to survive as a country. And I appeal, actually, um, uh, to the people who are handling the president that quite honestly history will record them and the president as the people who kick-started this downward spiral uh, uh, route that Nigeria is on that seems to um, really be uh, a, a downward spiral of no return. It's incredible that uh, the president of Nigeria will refer to a group of people as a dot in uh, the country that he is governing that will say that a decision legally taken, democratically taken, within the rights of the southern governors, that he will more or less reverse that decision. He has no such powers to reverse that decision because the land in my state is vested in my governor. It's not vested in the federal government. It's not vested in the person of the president. And therefore, he really legally has no right and cannot give routes that he's talking about gazetted. It's a defunct law that a people have freedom to drive on the highway. For instance, I am a car driver, that I can drive on the east-west road or on a, or a road does not make or a road my personal property. And that's what the president is saying. And he needs to know, people need to tell him that he is wrong, he is not right. He has no right to insist that people, governors, and Kyo Bricks, Ijo people, Ikwere people, Ogoni people, must give up their land to Fulani headsmen. There is no such right. And so what he is driving is actually um, going to bring war to this country. Mm. Uh, all right, and let's do a bit of a contextual analysis of um, that statement, dot in a circle, because so many people have been speaking on it. I don't know what you make of it, what kind of interpretation you make of it. it what's the president trying to say that uh, the Southeast agitation is a small problem? Or was he referring to the people of the Southeast as being insignificant? What's your interpretation of that? Well, I mean, um, Unfortunately, and maybe for historical purposes, remember the war. And I am a victim, and some of my family members are victims of the Civil War. So I recall the Civil War. I understand the Civil War. I know what led up to the, uh, to the Civil War. The president in that uh, interview with the, the television station was speaking as a as a warlord, he was speaking as a general at war with a country. That was the way he spoke. He referred to them and he reminded the, the Igbo people, because my people, I don't know how many people from my community or from uh, my states that have um, uh, businesses in Kano or Kaduna or Lagos. He was referring specifically to Igbo people and reminding them that they have a lot of property and investment outside the area that he had described as dot. Now, that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it was that it was clearly disregard, disdain to the people that he was referring to. Now, the whole Igbo nation are not IPOP. IPOP is a movement mm. headed by a group of people. IPOP is not an identity of a nationality. There are a na members of a nationality that are members of IPOP, just like there were members and still are members of men, just as there are members, Fulani headsmen. With, I mean, since uh, 
uh, before this time. People say that Fulani headsmen have lived amongst them in the southwest and in the southeast and, and stuff like that, which is true. Now, you cannot therefore say that the violence that is perpetrated by Fulani headsmen today in Nigeria is perpetrated by all Fulani people across across Nigeria. So to now act and, and threaten, it was a threat to the people and referring, actually, the, uh, the president made a claim which made me to react. The president made a claim and said that he heard and he pointed to his ears, he mm. did like this. Mm -hmm. He said, nobody told me. He said, I heard that uh, leaders, elders of the South-South and youths of the South-South have promised that there will this time, this time, what is this time? This time, it means he is um, anticipating a war. Mm -hmm. This time, there will be no access to, to, the, water, uh, to the ocean. What does he mean? The war was not about access to the ocean and it was not fought in the ocean. The war was fought in the land that is today southeast and um, and uh, and south south. And the uh, the uh, the majority of the damage uh, was done to the people and the land of this uh, of this area. Now, yes, All right. we uh, we were formerly of the eastern region, but we didn't. I want to make this clear. Please. We did not. My people of the Niger Delta region, my people, particularly the Ijaws, did not wage a war against Ndibo in, in 1968. It was the federal government that waged a war against Ndibo. What, what? May I also say that Adaka Boro did not get up and fight a war against Ndibo. He raised arms against the Federal Republic of Nigeria even before the coup and before the war. Oh. So it, it, the government refuses to teach our children history, oh. but when they want to refer to history, they are not truthful about history. And thank God for people like me, because I know what happened, and thank I will you. speak the truth. And consistent with you, I mean, one would wonder why, you know, the president showed so much excitement at the possibility of a particular region being landlocked, you know, in the subject case of the South South, talking about the secession. You know, that, that somebody said that was quite cynical. Uh, but, but going forward for a country where one, of, one line in our pledge says to defend her unity and uphold her honor and glory and have the president's body language speak of, you know, uh, uh, a divided front, and also a, a, a country that seems to be on the edge, you know, of a precipice. How do you define, you know, the presidential state of mind right now? Because some would say, and they used to say it was the presidency, not the president. But we've heard the president speak. And, and truth, truth be spoken, his body language as well as what he said speaks of a man who knows what he's talking about. I'm absolutely, I totally agree with you. And I have said this right from the beginning, from the moment he, he gave that first interview. I said, now we have uh, a president that wants to tell Nigerians something. Now, the Nigerians he is speaking to are the Nigerians that are being attacked, that are being killed, are the Christians that are being attacked, that are being killed. He's speaking to the Nigerians that he believes are a conquered people. Now, you asked me, what is my take? This is my take. This is my analysis. I am old enough to be responsible, to have a responsibility to speak the truth both to myself and to anybody else who cares to who cares to listen the president's body i hate to speak about anybody's body language but the president's so-called body language is one of war is one of disdain is one of disregard when um you are blatantly uh, taking rights that you don't have it's a threat it is an oppressive position to take against the people of the Southeast and the South-South and actually jamming the heads of the most critical people today in Nigeria, the South-South and the Southeast. And may I say this as well? Uh, people may not uh, see it like this, but let me say this. Now, some of us are of different ethnic heritage in this country. Some of us, therefore, who are of different ethnic heritage, 
if you look at me, you will see that I am of uh, a different uh, coloration. That coloration means that I have one parent who is white and one parent who is black, very clearly. Now, in Nigeria, I also come from a heritage that is not just a your heritage, that includes other people. In the Niger Delta, we marry, we intermarry. Shakiri marry Urobo, Urobo marry Shakiri. Now, if somebody has an Urobo mother and a Nijo father, and there is dispute between Urobo and Shakiri, how do you think that person feels? And this is what I want to highlight, that we may have our differences and disagreements as different ethnic nationalities. But when push comes to shove, when the bottom line is rich, we have to watch each other's back. Because if Ijo, somebody who has an Ijo father has uh, an, an evil grandmother, I mean, you can't even begin to, to uh, say to that person that that person has to make a decision between their Igbo heritage, which is through their father's mother or their mother's uh, father, and through the other heritage, which may be Shakiri or Robo. And these are the sensitivities that the government, particularly this government, and specifically the president, has chosen to ignore that you cannot, at the end of the day, knock the heads of Ndibo and their neighbors and their cousins together because we are cousins because we're closer. And I don't know too many people who have heritage that is in Ijo and also in, uh, in let's say, uh, Fulani or let's say Nupe or let's say uh, uh, Tim. But I know a lot of Ijo people, Ijo Shakiri people, uh, Robo people, Ogoni people who have Igbo heritage, whose grandmothers, grand uh, mothers are married to either Ogoni men or Ijo women and all those things. So at the end of the day, we will, we will love and protect ourselves, no matter our differences. All right. This uh, must be understood. Uh, all right. And uh, staying with the president um, claims about the South South leaders, I mean, he appeared to be quite gratified that the South-South leaders and South-South youths have said there will be no access to the sea for separatists of the Southeast. I know you can count 1 to 20 or 1 to 50 top leaders, vocal leaders in the Niger Delta, and Anne Kubrick will be mentioned there. Was there any time that leaders of the South-South or the youth leaders of the South-South ever met and said there will be no access to the sea, as claimed by the president? Absolutely not. Not that, not that I am aware of. Absolutely not. And I have spoken to key, um, uh, uh, key members of uh, different ethnic nationalities in the Niger Delta, and nobody gave the uh, president that impression. But the way I understood him, the president was very specific in how he passed that information out. He said he had... He was not told, he heard, he read that uh, elders and youths have said, look, there are people who are so frustrated in the Niger Delta that they do believe that Biafra is a movement that they believe in. Now, I and Kio Briggs believe in the self-determination and uh, responsibility and if it really comes to that and if my survival of my people depends only on that then we have to discuss a separation so that we can move forward that I believe in but do I uh, does that make me a member of the people agitating for the Republic of Biafra no it does not so now there are evils who do not believe in the agitation for the Republic of Biafra, that there are some evils and they have a right to that, mm -hmm. to believe in that Republic. Now, how they go about it and what comes out of it is their, is their choice. Mm -hmm. I have chosen my path and my path is let us restructure Nigeria, let uh, each state cater for itself, let us have self-determination within Nigeria. Now, if that's not possible, 
then a divorce is imminent. Even Walesho Inka said it, Absolutely. that unless this uh, country is restructured, that Nigeria is heading for dissemination, is heading for a breakup. Now, the president cannot say that he's not aware of this. He must be aware of this. He's a retired general. He, was, he spent his whole life in the army. He knows what he wants. himself and his people, and he has demonstrated that. And so what we are saying, what I and you is saying, as an Egyptian daughter, as a Niger Delta daughter, and as a cousin of so many other ethnic nationalities in the Niger Delta, we need peace. We want peace. We must have peace, and we must have equity and justice. How do we get this equity and justice? And how do we get this peace? That's, that's what we're asking for. That's exactly the way I was coming to. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned them. Uh, the toilet, Professor Bolivia, you're talking about, you know, uh, the need to do something because Nigeria was standing at the edge. Uh, I mean, we saw the protests on June 12th, Saturday, across the country, where we saw Lagos, uh, even in the FCT, some parts of the southwest, you know, protesting for different, you know, uh, needs, most especially on the issue of insecurity and uh, fairness and justice in the way that the president has handled insecurity. And even in London, in Chicago Square, there was a protest as well, and in Washington, D.C. But then you spoke about restructuring. We heard about, you know, uh, decentralization. We have talked about uh, looking at true federalism. This was one of the key conversations that was also pointed about during the campaign period of Mr. President and the FCT party, amongst other, you know, stalwarts. And, you know, it is quite interesting that now that restructuring has sort of become the clarion call amongst the leadership and the elite, amongst, you know, uh, different classes of, of political uh, aware citizens. It is very evident from the body language of Mr. President that he do not, he does not, and will not, you know, consider restructuring. And in that, guys, what do you think is the danger of that? Well, the danger is so blatantly... This, this government came into power telling Nigerians who voted for them, I didn't vote for them, telling Nigerians who voted for them that they understood, they, I mean, they, they know what restructuring is and they campaign on restructuring. But some of us also know, having listened to the president in the past, before he became president, mm -hmm. that he does not believe in restructuring. He said he would not even look at the 2014, 2014 um, uh, national conference report. He was not going to do anything about it. He was opposed to it. He didn't want his people to partake in it, yeah. but his people partook in it whether he likes it or not. Now, the reality, therefore, is this. The president is driving what he, the president, wants for the president and for his ethnic nationality. He is not driving what Nigerians want. And here lies the problem, because his ethnic nationality is not the only nationality in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And they are not the largest, they are not amongst the large uh, ethnic nationalities in Nigeria. And so the plan, as we see it now, as we have analyzed it, the plan to bring in his ethnic nationalities that are in other countries bringing them into Nigeria to lay claim to Nigerian heritage in any part of Nigeria is not acceptable. It is definitely not acceptable in my state. That's what we are saying. So the president has a right to have a different desire for his people and himself, just the same way we have a different desire. Look, during the men era, People like Chief E.K. Clark, people like Ann Kyo, people like uh, Dr. Igali, so many people, Timmy Alaibe, the whole lot of us. We know the roles we play in bringing about the stability of, um, uh, of the region before Yaradua, uh, or the unfortunate death of Yaradua. I miss that man very, very much. You know, nobody knows what Nigeria would have become. 
if he had not died. But nobody is questioning God. But the reality is Nigeria is faced with imminent danger. The danger of being separated. Some people may want it. Some people don't want it. But you see, what is keeping Nigeria going, whether we like it or not, is the oil that is in the Niger Delta. People will say, oh, oil doesn't mean anything. There is electric car coming. Electric car where? And even if the oil doesn't mean anything anymore, we'll leave the oil in where it is. Now they are facing gas. You can see everything about gas. We're not fools. We know that gas brings more money, and there is more gas reserve deposit in the Niger Delta region than there is even crude oil. And so we know why the president and both internal and external interests, economic and otherwise, are insisting that Nigeria must stay together. But you see, the question is, is not we, we're not saying Nigeria should not stay together. We're saying, how do we stay together? And we say, who is paying the, uh, the price? All this money this government is borrowing, where is the, the, the repayment coming from? You know, and where is the investment going to mm. when with this money? They're borrowing money to uh, now all of a sudden is railway, railway, railway. That's all we're hearing. Railway, railway. I went on the Ibadan Lagos uh, train for a program in uh, in uh, Oyo in Ibadan, and I went from Lagos to Ibadan. And look, I've been in trains all over the world, in other parts of the world. The, what the train I got on compared to even the, the oldest train in the United Kingdom. It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. The, the material is, uh, is poor. The, the building of the casting, the building of the train is poor. The seats are poor. It is 6,000 Naira for, uh, for, for first class. The chairs are low. There are no tables. And that's first class. This is arrant nonsense. And you're borrowing money to do all these things. And you're giving Nigerians a Photoshop. I have my own photos that I took. We were walking across planks to, uh, to go from one side of the railway. We were crossing the railway tracks to enter the, uh, to, uh, to, go on the uh, to go on the railway, um, I mean, to go on the train. And yet we hear this, uh, this, this government telling us of what a fantastic job this railway thing is. It is not a fantastic job. I have been on, at least I've been on the Lagos Ibadan, Ibadan train in the first class and right. it is nothing nothing mm. compared to even the economy trains that you have in uh, in england uh, between uh, manchester and uh, and I, london I'm sorry that I, think... I thank god that some of us are exposed and some of us do travel we see we're not blind I, thank you so much. I, I think that's much we can take. Uti, I yeah. was just about throwing in where the president said the youths have to behave themselves mm. if they want <laughs> wanted employment. All right. Yeah, please let me let me very quickly chip in there. You know, for for uh, for a president whose children, all his children, apart from the ones he had uh, uh, before his present wife, are youths, and for a president to say to other people's children that they have to behave themselves before they can have a job. So so they have to behave themselves before they can partake in politics. So that document is signed with them. It's not true like many right. things. They have to behave themselves before. How do you shoot them or and celebrate so or much. whatever democracy? And you, a president, you partook in demonstrations and nobody shot at you. Mm. Nobody shot at you. And yet you are shooting at other people's children. All right, but Madam Anke yeah. Briggs, that, that's how much you have time for. I, I don't know where you actually, when you boarded that train. Uh, is it recent? Unfortunately, we don't have yes, time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, recent. it was um, Before, it was on the 7th. 7th it was of the June. Day I went, was I it went after the Monday. commissioning? No, before. I went on Monday. I went on Monday to Ibadan. I left Ibadan on Wednesday. So I was on that train a day, two days before the uh, the president uh, went to commission it. Oh. It was he commissioned an unfinished project. All right. At least uh, the Lagos end to the Badon end. I sat on it for almost three hours. That, that's an it's very slow. I can walk faster than that train. <laughs> that's an interesting personal experience. But we'll do our own investigation on that as well to confirm uh, that uh, particular Absolutely. experience. Thank you so much, Ankyo Briggs, for joining us. Thank Have you. a wonderful day. Thank you for having me.